So uh, hello everyone, thank you so much for uh, joining our very first DEI seminar in fall of 2021, which will be probably the last DEI seminar in this year, but it will give us a really good start. Um, so we are really fortunate to have Raghu uh, presenting his work. Uh, Raghu is a professor of biostatistics and the director of, and research professor at the Institute for Social Research. He's a research professor in the Joint Department in Survey Methodology at the University of Maryland as well. He also directs the Biostatistics Collaborative and Methodology Research Core, uh, a research unit designed to foster collaborative and methodological research with the researchers in other departments in the School of Public Health and other allied uh, schools. So he directs many, many different course, which is a really long list. So I will stop here. And today we are really glad to uh, hear about a very exciting and uh, interesting topic, which is how do we track health disparities using module data sources with varying measurement and response properties. I've been looking forward to this talk for a long time. So uh, thank you so much, Raghu, for uh, presenting this. So uh, maybe you can get started. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction. And um, so this is sort of a continuation of the, my work I've been doing on uh, measuring the health disparities using multiple data sources. And, um, and so I will present some of these new work that I've been doing, and then uh, we'll have a, a time for discussion at the end. So Okay, I don't know why it is not advancing. Okay, good. Um, yeah, you know, we're tracking the health disparities in a society that we live in, with, with very highly stratified uh, at this point, and it's been stratified for quite some time globally as well, uh, is an important problem for many uh, reasons. So here I list some of the three reasons. So it gives us a pulse on the society. So variability uh, across the uh, broad spectrum of uh, constructed uh, groups in our society uh, uh, that assessing that heterogeneity gives a, gives a way to window uh, to study our society itself. It may be useful for uh, policy development and also for uh, cost and economic consideration. So there are a variety of reasons why we should be reading, looking at this uh, health disparities across various groups over, uh, over time. The number of issues that comes up in uh, when we are talking about tracking health disparity uh, is how do we measure health and how do we define the groups to be tracked and how to define disparity. What does it mean by uh, disparity? And how to design studies uh, to track disparities. I think, are we going to take the studies as it is, or are we going to really design studies to really uh, assess these uh, uh, disparities? So the number of issues I'll be talking about, and then I think towards the end, I will I'll think about where we are going in the uh, future. So to set the stage for this presentation, I'm going to consider this six race ethnic groups um, I, I, I realize that these are not, um, uh, these are coarsened way of looking at the race itself, but I think, I think to start with, I'm going to talk about these six race ethnic groups. Hispanic is a very broad group. There are a lot of heterogeneities within Hispanic. If you take any particular group, I think there will be a considerable heterogeneity within those groups. So I'll come back to that in terms of how do we assess those heterogeneities uh, within these groups. So we have six uh, race ethnic groups, Hispanic, white, African. -American. Excuse me, Raghu, are, yes? are your slides meant to be advancing at least when I'm looking, I'm not, I'm still seeing the title slide. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. Maybe you can share again or something. Yeah, let me share again. So while Raghu is sharing, I just wanted to add, I forgot to say that uh, when, if anyone have any question, you can either uh, put your question in the chat function or uh, directly speak up. You can also raise your hand. <laughs> Thank you. Is it advancing? Let me know. Is it advancing now? N not from my... No. And, and you're, you're showing the view that shows the slide and the 
the the thumbnails of the coming slides. I, um, so the when I when I start the um, what do you see now? One second. It Same thing. Change. Hey Ragu, when you were sharing, did you choose share window or did you choose share screen? Uh, screen? Let me check. Uh, I think share screen. So I was going to say, we were having some of these problems the other day. And if you share your window, uh, PowerPoint was doing some wonky things. But if you share the entire, your entire screen, that seemed to solve the problem. So maybe try one of those two. Uh... No, I think I think um, I am sharing the. Now we see the presentation view. Yes. Oh, did you see the presentation view? Yeah, the one for yeah. Right now we can see the presentation view where it's like we can see your the next slide, and notes. Oh, that's not what I want to show. Yeah, you can choose an option to uh, uh, do the show within a window. Is it display settings? Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, yes. Does anyone know how to show full screen? Okay, is it showing now? My, what is it showing now? There's, there's a slideshow menu option. Hmm, let me. And then there's a, an icon set up slideshow. And there you can choose browse by an individual window. I don't know. Uh, and then you can share this window. Where where is that? Where is that one? You said you said a uh, slideshow. Then yeah. for, on the ribbon there is setup slideshow somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And then there are uh, radio buttons of different show types in the left uh, upper left corner. So I would I would try browsed by an individual window. Okay. And then try to share that window. Okay, now let me share again. Uh, What do you see now? We see, yeah, it works. Oh, it's good. Okay, good, very good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, so the for this presentation, I'm going going to force on for, uh, take the six race ethnic groups: Hispanic, White, African American, Black, Asian, American Indian, Alaskan Native, on other or multi-race. And I know that each one of these are sort of a very heterogeneous group, but I'm taking them as an example to illustrate the issues in terms of how to define the groups to be uh, tracked. I'm also going to take the one aspect of the health, which is the uh, diabetes. Um, and I know that there are lots and lots of other, other health conditions, matters 
uh, we should be considering them all of them together, but I think for the, for the time being focused on diabetes. I'm again taking this 12 year window, uh, the time period 2009 to 2020. Now, what are the data sources that people use in terms of tracking the um, uh, health disparities? Are these large scale national probability surveys? And uh, I think uh, one may not have noticed that, but I think these national probability surveys enshrine the DEI principles. So every subject has a positive probability of being included in the sample that addresses the issue of inclusiveness. Uh, and typically we go for the, uh, the designs called as EPSM designs, equal probability selection method that everybody has a same probability of being included in the sample that addresses the sort of an equity concerns. And sometimes an equity concern may be conflicting with the diversity concerns. Uh, that's where we use stratification and oversampling to address the issue of diversity. So, um, so this, this maybe I think we have, I'm recasting it, but I think these principles uh, of designing the national probability surveys has been the hallmark uh, um, of, 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 our, of our field enshrining the principles of DEI. Um, there are other data sources that are available nowadays in terms of administrative data sources and now I think we have all these panel surveys. These are sort of a professional respondents. You recruit a panel and bombard them with a couple of surveys every month or so, and they fill it out. These are these panel could be constituted based on probability uh, based sample, or it could be opt-in or volunteer or special purpose like nurses health study or British doctor study and so on. Uh, these are all other data sources, but I think the, um, you know, the, the kind of, we don't know what the properties of those, um, those data sources are, but I think those are becoming more and more uh, available. But none of these designs are ideal for studying disparity. Uh, why? Because in order to assess the group difference, uh, we all know that because we do that in a randomized clinical trial, is that uh, if you go to FDA, you need to make sure that you have equal sample sizes in the control and the treatment group. I don't think the um, FDA would accept saying that I'm going to have a fifth of the sample size for the controls and I'm going to have all others in the treatment, control, treatment group. So, so to assess the group difference, we need equal sample sizes across these groups. And there is no survey that does this equal uh, sample sizes. So we need to really account for the differences in the variability in the assessing the prevalence rates or whatever, whatever we are comparing across these groups. That is kind of a nuisance that kind of interfere with the uh, assessment of the group differences because one is imprecisely measured, the other one is more precisely measured. So we have the problem of comparing uh, two things with, um, with a varying uh, precisions. So I think that we need to think about sort of a, uh, what is the ideal design for studying the disparity would be the equal sample size. And we need to consider sort of assimilating our uh, our situations in that context of the ideal design, even though we may not conduct that uh, ideal design of, of us studying the disparity. Now, measuring health uh, also poses a challenge. Like let's look at the diabetes. So most of the time we rely on this self-report. Did health professional ever tell you that you have diabetes? And then subsequent question would be, are you taking pills or insulin to treat diabetes? So that's a predominantly the uh, survey questions that we, did, we, we, um, we rely on. The clinical definition would be to have a fasting glucose greater than 126 or the hemoglobin A1C is greater than 6.5. So that could be sort of a biological definition or clinical definition of diabetes that may not be available um, in all uh, surveys. 
So there are here I'm giving you uh, four examples, the way in which we can define what diabetes really mean in this context. Uh, Self-report one is that you should be told by health professional that you have diabetes and you should be taking medications for it. So um, that either you are taking the pill or you're taking the insulin. So that's a one definition of uh, self-report that maybe it's sort of a strict definition in that not only that you have been told, but you also should be taking uh, uh, pharmacological treatment for that. Now we recognize that even though we are told by health professional that I have diabetes, I may not have resources to really go and get tested and get medicines and so on. So it's not necessary that I would always take medications uh, even if I'm told that I have a, a diabetes. So slightly uh, looser definition, more, more expansive definition would be that you are told by health professional or that you are taking medication. So just being told itself is sufficient uh, with or without taking uh, medication. The clinical definition will be that you are adding a supplemental information of whether or not your fasting glucose is greater than 126 or your A1C is greater than 6.5. Here, one is there that although self-report, you may, the doctor may have told you that you have diabetes and then you are taking medication, but you may not have, have access to healthcare professional. Therefore, there's no occasion for you to be told that you have diabetes. So in that case, uh, you may end up uh, saying that no doctor did not tell me that I have diabetes, but when you go and get tested that your fasting glucose may be one, greater than 126 or A1C may be greater than 6.5. That is, you might have all these undiagnosed diabetes people in the population and, and therefore they will be detected if you take additional uh, blood samples on them. And clinical definition two is the uh, taking the definition self-report two, and then adding the supplement thing that whether or not your fasting glucose is greater than 126 or A1C is greater than 6.5. So even within this narrow context of measuring diabetes, we have these four ways. These are not the only four ways, but I think these are four different ways in which you can assess whether the person has diabetes or not. Now, uh, here is the, uh, of course, the NHANES, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, provides a way for us to really uh, measure all these four kinds of um, uh, diabetes um, um, prevalence uh, because they ask the self-report in the questionnaire part, but they also take a sample and then blood sample and then measure their fasting glucose and A1C. So if you look at the uh, six race ethnic groups, and if you look at the self-report one, two, and clinical one and two, you, you see a very different pictures uh, across these uh, race ethnic groups. So if you just based on self-report one, then 14.6% of Hispanic have diabetes, and whereas if you take uh, most expansive definition, clinical two, you have a 24.4% of Hispanic being um, uh, diabetic. So these are age, gender adjusted prevalence rate. And this is differential across these race ethnic groups. So you can see that there is almost a 10 point difference in the Hispanic, and there is a four point difference in white and a nine point difference and so on. There's a the differences in these definitions, which definition you, you adopt, really depends upon your uh, race ethnicity as well. Uh, and the way I think it is structured, I think, I think you can understand that I think there are a lot of people who have um, uh, issues with in, in terms of healthcare access or being told that they have, you have diabetes across these uh, various race ethnic groups. So you can see that there's a big differences across these uh, groups in terms of which definition we use in terms of um, uh, uh, this definition of a diabetes. So 
The other issue is also what data sources. Are there differences across these data sources? So the National Center for Health Statistics uh, collects this data called the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, National Health Interview Survey. These have been sort of uh, uh, very well-designed, uh, large probability sample uh, surveys. But if you take the uh, recently, uh, National Center for Health Statistics has been using uh, what is called as a panel survey. So one of the panel is the NORC has the AmeriSpeak span uh, a panel, which is, I think our University of Michigan also uses that panel uh, um, to measure some of these, uh, some of these health, health related issues. And they have been sort of uh, experimenting with the uh, panel surveys uh, in 2015 and 16, and also in 2019, uh, where by, by recruiting members from this panel, these are all panels that have been uh, participating in a variety of surveys over time, and, and they ask the same questions as in HIS or NHANES. And you can see that I think these uh, rates are, at least in the uh, interview part, uh, the rates are uh, somewhat similar and enhance is slightly different from the uh, from the um, uh, from from others, but not a whole lot different. At least I was glad that I think that at least the age age gender adjusted prevalence rate seemed to be similar across these uh, various um, uh, ethnic groups. Although there are some variations in these in these estimates, the same thing happens uh, in in some in uh, self report too that you can see that NHANES uh, provides a higher uh, prevalence rate than compared to all other uh, surveys. Uh, that may be because I think in this, in, because it is a national health and nutrition examination survey, maybe they know that they are going to be measured uh, uh, for their blood pressure, uh, for their diabetes. So maybe I think they have a better recall properties or not. But I don't know, I think there are some differences across these, um, these studies, but in any hands in particular seem to be somewhat different. Now, how do you measure health disparity? Um, about 20, you know, uh, about 20, years, 20 years ago, there was a panel where the National Center for Health Statistics uh, assembled a group of us and they said that, okay, and come up with some measures of disparity that we should be using. And essentially, I think they have a G groups and then you have a prevalence rates for those G groups. And then you want to come up with a measure of disparity. And there are lots of uh, measures of disparities that were discussed during these uh, two day workshop. And, and then so many, so many things, so many measures. Essentially, I think it is a measure means any kind of a discrepancy across these G prevalence rate. And then, uh, and then a year later, uh, there was a panel by European Union and World Health, World Health Organization where also I participated. They also, come, they also asked about how do we measure the disparities and so on. So I wrote an article in 2006 based on that uh, work where I proposed these three measures of disparities. So, so one is sort of a social justice perspective is that, is that what is the maximal difference between uh, across this G prevalence rate? So the highest minus the lowest value. That means that as long as that discrepancy is there where, where there is no equity there, so therefore the rates are not uh, uh, similar across. So the largest minus the smallest difference uh, gives us a window of that pulse on that uh, discrepancy. Now, I, think, I don't think this is a great measure in, in some sense. Uh, if you're talking about obesity, you can reduce this social justice by everybody becoming obese. So uh, therefore, if everybody becomes obese and then there is no discrepancy, that's not a, it's not a good measure, but it's measures sensitive to whether you're talking about a good outcome or a bad outcome. Um, the, then the other one is a public health target base. So there is a target rate you can fix and then, and then see whether or not we are meeting that target rate. So theta G, the largest one minus the target rate, and that could be used as a measure of disparity that 
that we haven't achieved a target rate uh, in a global sense. The other one I liked about was this also the burden of disease is that which group is far away from the average. Uh, and then the largest difference, that group that is farthest away from the overall mean, that means that that is, that is bearing the burden of the disease. Therefore, that may be a one way of measuring the burden of disease. So in this, in this context, I'm going to focus only on the first uh, first and the last, because I don't have any target rate for what should be the target rate for the diabetes. So, so Delta SE from the social equity perspective and the burden of disease perspective. These are the two measures uh, that we want to, uh, uh, I'm going to focus on for, for now. So here is the uh, model that I used in order to assess, to obtain the posterior distribution of those discrepancy measures. So if I have a PIG, the age gender adjusted prevalence rate for group G from study I, then I use this uh, arc sign transformation for normality, uh, which is normal with sine inverse of square root of theta G sigma square. Uh, theta G is uniform zero one, and the log of sigma is uh, very flat prior, diffuse flat prior for that. So here I'm using the, uh, the kind of, you can think of this as a simulating under the equally weighted rates. So simulating under the equal sample size design. So although my sample, sample, sample sizes are not same, so I'm taking the estimated rate and I'm pretending that what would happen if I had done the equal sample size uh, design, because that's an ideal design for uh, measuring the uh, discrepancy. Otherwise, I think the sampling variability will, in, it will, will, will uh, differences in the sampling variability will interfere with assessing what, what, the, uh, what the situation is actually in the population if I had taken the equally equal sample size design. So if this is the estimated rate pulling across all the data sources uh, in 2015-16, so I have the two panel surveys, then I have a two NIH, a, a, NHIS surveys, then I have a, a one enhanced survey. So if I take out these, so you can, this is the report and uh, self-report one for the rate and self-report two rate. And you can see that there is a, there is a, a almost a 10 point difference um, um, if you take the self-report two and, and, and also a seven point difference uh, if you take the self-report one between across these uh, race ethnic uh, groups. But more importantly, I know that self-report one and self-report two are not a really a great way of uh, measuring the uh, diabetes because I know that we know that the uh, people with uh, uh, people who say no to self-report might still have diabetes because they're, uh, they're uh, blood glucose and fasting glucose is higher than 126 and or the A1C is greater than 6.5. So here I correct the model. Uh, I have a correction model. So you have a self-report data that could be estimated from all the data sources and you have the um, correction rate that you want to apply. So I accepted that if your self-report is one, that means you have diabetes. So YCL is kind of a gold standard definition of diabetes. Uh, I accepted that if somebody reported that self-report is one, that means they have the disease. So probability that YCL is one given YSR equal to one is one. But if you did say that you have the uh, diabetes, doctor ever told you that you have a diabetes, then you still have the positive probability of having the disease that is a pi. But what our goal is to really look at the marginal probability of YCL being equal to one, which is theta plus pi times one minus theta, a fraction of the people who say no, they have the diabetes. So I'm adding that to the prevalence rate. And then the theta and pi are jointly estimated uh, by draw from the uh, joint posterior distribution of this uh, two parameters, theta and pi. And these are the uh, 
error rate, the pi, the estimate of pi for various race ethnic groups. So you can see that there's a very different across these uh, race ethnic groups. The 7.4% of the people who are uh, in 7.4% of the Hispanic are uh, are reporting who report that they don't have the doctor never told them that they have diabetes or actually diabetes diabetic based on the measures of the uh, blood glucose and and the um, hemoglobin A1C whereas 3.6 percent of the white and 6.4 percent of the African American so on so I think the underestimation of the diabetes just based on the self report is differential across these. Uh, six race ethnic uh, groups. Therefore, we need to sort of a correct, uh, uh, correct for this uh, error rate. So, so if you take the measuring the disparity, uh, uncorrected versus corrected uh, for three time periods, so 2009 to 2010, 2015 to 16 and 2019 and 20. So these are the two, three periods that I'm talking about during that 12 year period. So the, from the social equity perspective, that is the largest gap is about 12.7% in 2009, 10. And it has reduced to 9.8% in 2015, 16 and 9.1% in 2019, uh, 20. Uh, if you take a burden of disease, uh, the law big group is uh, the 10.6% the is away from the overall mean. The largest group, the most burdensome group is about 10.6% away from the overall mean and 7.8% in 2015, 16 and 6.8% in 2019, 20. So you can see that disparity is sort of a, a, a slowly uh, is, going down, but it's not a, um, you know, in 12 year period, we're not big differences. If you look at the corrected with predictive measures, you see the pictures are really slightly, um, uh, you know, there is a, there's a, there is a, a bigger difference in 2019, 2009 to 10, 13.6% to 11% and 10.6%. So still, I think there's a 2% uh, difference is still there between the self-report and the uh, corrected clinical uh, measures. And the same thing we see in the burden of disease is that is it is uh, going down, but not a whole lot. But I think why why is it going down? Is it going down because all of the improvement is happening in the um, uh, minority groups, or is uh, is, is what is happening? What's the reason for these uh, going down? So here is the data, uh, individual prevalence rate uh, based on our uh, uh, the model. You can see that every almost everybody is going up, um, but the whites have gone up a little bit more than, uh, than other groups. So so if you look at the uh, self-report, Hispanic 14.7, 15.1, 15 15.3 over the three time periods, uh, whereas 8.4 jumped to 9.4 and, and the steady stayed uh, 9.4. So in a sense, I think that uh, what is happening is that the, uh, the discrepancies are reducing because not because especially the things are going down in one group, they are all going up, but differentially going up. So, so um, in some sense, I think I think that discrepancy is uh, remaining. You know, they are all converging, but I think they are converging to the wrong end. Um, so, this is happening across all uh, all the race uh, ethnic groups. So, so it's not that I think we are we are uh, controlling the diabetes, but I think we are all going up in a very different rate so that the, it, the, any of the discrepancy measures are giving you that uh, big, dif the differences, but, but underlying the differences is that I think we are all uh, becoming a little bit more diabetic. Some people are more so than others. So, so the prevalence of diabetes slightly increases over time. Uh, disparities between various race ethnic groups persist. I think there's still big differences between these race ethnic groups. 
uh, and we also said self-report may not be uh, give us an accurate picture. So we have to use uh, sort of a measurement error uh, model, but I think I think measurement error is kind of a pattern by race ethnicity because uh, unequal uh, structure in the society. And it's really important to collect data by state, and this is a kind of a global data. I was looking at the national data. It may be important to collect data by state to assess the uh, impact of various interventions and societal issues. So one of the things that I'm currently looking at is the now we have enough data to really look at the um, the Affordability Care Act, and some some states expanded, some state, states did not expand. By using a state level data, we could look at the uh, health disparities by the state and see what is happening in in those uh, in those conditions. Now, where do the future con considerations? So here I use the race. Uh, ethnicity in the sort of a six categories. So if you look at the uh, prevalence of multi-race categories, that has been steadily increasing. And then more and more people are opting to choose uh, multi-race categories. So the kind of a categorization uh, may not be a right approach to define these uh, race ethnic groups. So should we be thinking about sort of a more like a, a continuum of, of, of our uh, composition of our society in terms of race, ethnicity. And one idea would be to use some sort of a, a item response theory model to really con construct the continuous construct of what race, uh, uh, race ethnicity really mean uh, in the society. So I've just begun uh, some exploration using the uh, um, American Community Survey data, which kind of collects expansively the various uh, levels that people can check off their boxes on, on the race. But unfortunately, I think many of these data, health data, uh, are not available publicly. So we have to do it do it in a in a secured RDC, the uh, Research Data Center context, uh, because of the confidentiality reasons. Uh, health is also a multifaceted concept. So how do we assess the health? I've just took the diabetes, but there are many inputs to it, disease, risk factors, and health behaviors. So here I'm, I'm introducing, uh, I'm looking at the concept of using some sort of an uh, IRT models, the item response theory models to develop the construct of health, taking the diseases as inputs uh, risk factors as inputs and health behaviors as inputs to get a multi-dimensional construct of what the health really means uh, with the dimensions being whether you have a diseases, whether you have risk factors, or whether you have a conducive or non-conducive health behaviors. So these are different dimensions that we can look at and then look at the discrepancies across the uh, uh, various uh, race categorization. Um, these are some of the uh, future work that I'm, I'm um, really considering, and I thought uh, uh, it's an interesting area for me, and, and, and I hope you, you, you're interested, and, and I'm opening now up for the questions. Thank you so much, Raghu, for such an interesting discussion. Uh, any questions from the audience? I have a starting question to warm up. So uh, can you talk a little bit more about what is a item response theory? Uh, the item response theory is something that is used in the educational assessment. So for example, if you're taking uh, 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 SAT or GRE or any of these assessment, uh, you are given um, a set of questions and based on that questions, they estimate your ability or um, so it's kind of a latent variable modeling. There's a latent construct called race. I'm trying to, I'm going to assess that by, by the options that you choose. Um, oh. The same way I think the, uh, the diseases, risk factors, health behaviors you have 
uh, there's a there's a latent construct called health that I'm trying to assess using that using that model. I see. That's very helpful. Thank you. Looks like Lars with his hand. Yes. Um, thank you, Hugo, for this very nice presentation. Um, I learned a lot. Um, when you presented this correction approach, I wonder how representative are individuals that have a clinical diagnosis and self-report data compared to the people who only have self-report data? Um, so can yeah. we really use the one as a proxy for the others? Yeah, so all these rates are age gender adjusted. I think, I think if you look at the age and gender, um, they are very similar or there's slight differences there, but I adjusted for age, gender age and gender differences. So these are all age gender adjusted prevalence rates. So now in terms of differences, um, what do you mean? Give, can you give me an example of what differences you're thinking about? So when you introduced this um, inter um, correction factor in the beginning, it kind of, there was this discrepancy between a clinical test and people who self-reported. Um, yeah, this slide here, oh, you, next one. I'm not sure which one it was. Yeah. But you kind of use the individuals where you have clinical data and self report data, both to identify individuals where there's a discrepancy between the clinical diagnosis and self report. Oh, so they're all the same subjects in the survey data. In, they're all coming from NHANES. Oh, okay. So in the survey part, they ask questions whether you have diabetes or not. And then, then they, they, they take a lab, they take a draw of blood, and then they fasting blood, then they assess whether they have a, their fasting glucose is greater than 126 or their A1C is greater than 6, 6.5. Uh, these are nationally representative sample. Right. And those clinical tests that are randomly selected for those individuals, or is it yes. done for oh. Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? I, I have a, another question. So when you talk about the measuring health disparity where you have three um, measurements, um, I, I, I recently heard of things like um, doing something almost like a, uh, like a counterfactual type of the prevalence rates in each group. For example, uh, uh, suppose I am looking at uh, one particular group, and then I would say, uh, what's the difference? Uh, I don't know, how, uh, something like, suppose I have a reference group, and then what's the difference in the prevalence, prevalence, prevalence rates? Had everybody been in that reference group or versus another uh, race group? Yeah, um, yeah, I think the problem, I think, I think, um... There you have to choose one reference group. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, so here, these measures kind of avoid that problem of what the reference group should be. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm I'm just looking at this as as sort of a where is the gap? What is the largest gap? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, as far as as long as that largest gap is there, then there is a discrepancy. There is a disparity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. And as long as there is a one group which is uh, which is bearing the burden of the disease being far away from the overall rate, I don't know which group it is, but I think as long as the group is there, then I have a, I think that there's a measure of discrepancy. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other questions? So Yajian has a question. Thanks, Raghu. I, I have been hearing this project for many years. Did you think about geography? Like, can you create these indices across areas? Yes, yes. I think that's a, that's the thing that I am, I'm looking at the state level data at this point and see whether I can construct these um, um, these estimates or these discrepancies across the states, um, within a state, 
and then looking at the distribution of these discrepancies across the state. So I'm, I'm, I'm currently looking at that uh, using the HIS data because the, unfortunately, I think the correction data is available only in, in Haines and that I think they don't have a state level indicators in the data. So I'm, I'm trying to get that state level data for that, for that as well. I see. Interesting. So you have to rely on enhance on that. And then for the other, like administrative data, do you think that you can get like national level or from census? Like yes. So, so there is, there is, um, there is a, um, in um, electronic health record data is being collected uh, from various states in, uh, in, in, um, in, by NCHS, so that might be another opportunity to look at that data as well. I see. But the because problem I've... is that I think they are, we are, we are not sure whether it's a randomly selected individuals or they are coming for some specific uh, reasons and how, yeah. how, how far they are generalizable. Yes, I, I see there are like, Philippa Clark's work. So she is creating adversity index on the census check level. So using the ACS data. And there's another measure called the depreciation index trying to accommodate with the SES measures. But I feel like it could be cool to have a house disparity measure on the census check level. Then when you evaluate the neighborhood effect, that would be right. an important predictor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think you can see that I haven't really looked at the education or any of those other variables here because I consider all of them to be outcomes. And I have a difficulty in, in some of the epidemiology analysis where they adjust for education. I, th I don't think that the high school education from a, from a school which has a dilapidated buildings and poor infrastructure and very poor uh, teacher resources and so on, teaching resources, teacher resources, is anyway equivalent to high school education in an affluent neighborhood. And, and putting them all as one education variable. So that's kind of a surrogate for the way we are structured in our society, uh, in a segregated society that we are structured in. So I don't see that education from, from, for the whites, predominantly whites, and education from predominantly black, they're kind of the uh, same. And somehow in our, in our regression modeling frame, framework, we put them as one variable, but they're not, they are two variables. Uh, one is measured for only one, one race group, the other one is measured for other race group, but they're not the same. So, so, so I have a problem with that. And so, in terms of uh, using the socioeconomic status or using the education or any of these things that I think um, have those kinds of uh, issues in terms of there are two different variables and the definition of the variables itself is different. So exactly the self-report is not the same definition, same variable for everybody. Self-report is different variable for different people. So therefore, if you are assessing diabetes and you have to really be tailored to the knowing that there are differences in, in, in the way I think what the question means to people. Oh, thank you. So then when you merge data, you have to consider all these sources. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Irina. You're muted. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. It's it's exciting to see this extension of the work that I was involved years ago yeah. in this in this modeling of disparities. I have a question about your latent modeling that you think for the race or for the health. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned that you consider the IRT models like assuming one latent variable, right? On the continuum. I wonder why do you, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, go ahead. Why do you think it's a better approach than than modeling it as a latent class? Yeah, I think I think uh, you're you're right. I think it may be a um, it may be end up with the latent class, but I think I was thinking about it as kind of a multi-dimensional IRT model as well. It's not a one-dimensional alone. It could be a multi-dimensional uh, IRT model. But I don't think we have explored that possibilities using the data at the present time. So so people are really thinking about taking the multi-race and mapping them into single race. I think that that may be a backward technology. I think, I think we may want to go from the from multi-race to really think about what it means in the context of the social construct. And maybe the latent class might be one way of doing it or multi-dimensional IRT models might be another way of thinking about this, uh, about it. But I think I want to make sure that I think whatever the, whatever the latent construct comes up, it correlates well with the sort of a some some underlying concept of race. Um, I don't know whether it'll be um, it'll be uh, dealing with um, skin color or I don't know what it is going to yeah. be, but I think yeah. I, would, I would just like to see what it is coming out yeah. to be. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Any other questions? I have another question. I recently uh, also learned about uh, something like when, so when we, when you go through like the self report, uh, when you say ask people questions, is there any like non response? How do you deal with non response? Um, Yes, I think I think there are uh, in this. Uh, fortunately, in these data, I think there are very little item non-response. Um, and and here also they ask about: uh, Did doctor ever tell you that you have a diabetes? You have a three options. The option mm -hmm. is that yes, no, borderline. Borderline is like all. The, the their uh, glucose level and things. Yeah, so there's, uh, yeah, I think doctor may have said that. Oh, you have a borderline diabetes, you know. But I consider for this definition, I consider them to be non-diabetic, mm -hmm. unless they have the um, glucose data, which says that their their fasting glucose is greater than one twenty six, or their hemoglobin A one C is greater than six point five. But that's a critical piece of uh, clinical measures that we need in order for, for us to really uh, calibrate this self-report data. And, and Irina was talking about, we also looked at the, uh, in, in old paper, we also looked at the hypertension. Uh, so you may say that the doctor ever tell you that you have a hypertension, you may say no, but when we measure you, uh, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, you might have blood pressure as well. So in many diseases, this plays out because of the, um, the way I think access to healthcare or our ability to get the care, ability to sort of take time off and go and get measured and take care is very, very differential across the race ethnic groups. Yes. Yeah, very important question. So um, any other questions? I also wanted to uh, remind people, uh, please uh, sign in using the, uh, uh, the, the link that we put in the chat. Okay, so uh, if no further questions, let's give Raghu applause. Thank you so much for such an interesting topic. It's very, very fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone. So we will, uh, so the uh, uh, talk is recorded. Raghu, are you okay with, uh, if someone wants to watch the recording, we can share with them the link? Oh, sure. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye.
Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Ragu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.